we will start our session and I hope that you will work with us and that you will find this sessions very informative. Um, let's start. Now, grade 12s, when we look at our economics question paper, so we will now focus on paper one. And paper one, you all know this, the reason why we emphasize this is that sometimes students do not know which content to study for their examination question papers. So paper one will consist of macroeconomics and economic pursuits. You know the topics, it is in your manual. Then let's look at how the question papers are constructed. First of all, you will see that paper one, your main topics is macroeconomics and economic pursuits. But you will find these content in certain questions in the examination. If you look at question section A, question one, that will cover both macroeconomics and economic pursuits. Then let's look at section B. Now in section B, it is important to note that question two and question four deals with macroeconomics. Question five in your section C also deals with macroeconomics. So if you choose and you've concentrated on macroeconomics, then you know that these are the questions that speak to what to macroeconomics. When we look at economic pursuits, you will find again section A Question one covers both macroeconomics and economic pursuits. Question three and four deals with economic pursuits. And question six in your essays also deals with economic pursuits. So when you prepare yourself for the examination, you should know that where, where is my, my strong point? What am I going to focus on so that I can make an informed decision when I start my examination? That is very important. And if you see, when you look at, when you look at the question papers, I've, when I go to schools, sorry for this, when I go to schools and the, exa the, 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 the people who invigilate, the senior invigilator, usually tell the learners you've got 10 minutes before the start of this examination to read through your question paper then i when i go to monitor i usually see that a lot of learners start with question one now now students or grade 12 remember that question one is compulsory you must do it. So therefore, I would advise you that when you have that 10 minutes time to read through the question paper, start with section B and see which questions are you better prepared in. And then you make your decision at the start of the question paper. So if you then say, okay, question two is my strong point, and question four, then you know that that will basically covers macroeconomics. When you choose question, when you are more for economic pursuits, then you will see that question three and four is your questions that you are going to cover. So take your 10 minutes before the start of the exam to go through a section B and go through your section C and then you make your decisions. And because at the end of the day, what, what I also find in the exam when we mark, some learners do all three questions in section B. Now that is very dangerous, uh, grade 12. The examiners only mark the first two and they draw a line through the third one. You can only do 
two questions in section B and one question in section C. So that is why please make sure of those instructions. That is why it is always important to read through your instructions. Now let's, I think that is clear. Now let's look. You forgot to say Let's look at the essays. Now again, this is very important. Um, I, there's a list of essays which we get from the examination guidelines. Now it's important that those are identified possible essays. Now in Mac paper one, macroeconomics, let's deal with this one quickly and we see macroeconomics paper one. The first one deals with markets. The second one deals with a new economic paradigm. The third one deals with features underpinning forecasting. The other one objectives of the public sector and then the reasons for public sector failures and then international trade. Now these two public sector failures and discuss the reasons for international trade. These are new questions which were not asked previously. It is new questions that are added to the exam guideline and is identified as essays. So at the end of the day, when we look at this one, the one with regard to the markets, the four sector, now that question was asked last year in November 2020. Now there's some sort of unwritten rule which state that if a question was asked last year in November, it will not be tested in this year as an essay, but it can be tested in section A and in section B. So at the end of the day, so if that question was asked last year, then you only have five questions left to study for macroeconomics, which can come in the exam. So that is why it's important to identify the five, the topic. And for example, if you choose macroeconomics, if you choose macroeconomics, then you know that you have five questions that you must study and that you must know by heart because one of those five then will come in the exam. So these are the essay questions. You have it in your manual. Make sure that you study the essays, work out your essays, study it, and then at the end of the day, you will be able to, to um, answer these. You know what, when I mark, when we mark at the end of the year, we found that learners who attempt their essays pass their papers. Those learners who do not attempt an essay, they perform, perform poorly in the exam. So my advice to you, Ma, is that Attempt the essays, study the essays. You know there are five. One of them will come in the exam. And I think that is not a tall order. Everybody can do it. And that means that you can have 26 marks. So for paper one, okay. So for economics pursuits paper one, Again, the essays is identified. You have the essays in your manual. I'm not going to go through it. So there you can see, but this was asked in June. By the end of the day, there are six questions that can be asked. One of them can come in the exam. Now, grade 12, I'm going to make an example and I'm going to assist you with something. For example, how do I prepare for an essay? Let, let's look at this question. Discuss in detail the reasons for international trade. Now, this is an example, grade 12. Now, how do you 
study and how do you attempt this essay in the exam? Let's look, for example, now a question like this can be asked in different ways. If you look because there are demand reasons and there are supply reasons. So they can ask the question, for example, discuss in detail the reasons for international trade. So that means that that answer, in that answer, you must write about demand reasons and you must write about supply reasons. Are you with me? If they can also ask the question another way, they can ask you, discuss the demand reasons for international trade. Then that question only deals with demand. A third question they can also ask is, discuss the supply reasons for international trade. And in this case, you only write about the supply reasons. Can you see grade 12? It is very important that when you study a question like this, that you study it in its totality. You study it because if you study the question in its totality, it means that they can ask the question in which way you will be able to answer that question. That is why it's important that you should read the instructions, you should read the questions thoroughly. Now, again, a question like this, discuss the reasons for international trade. When you look at this question, it has a lot of subheadings. Now let's look there. It has subheadings. Now when you write this in the exam, for each subheading, you will get one mark. And then when you get that one mark, you write beneath each one, you write the sentences which you've studied explaining the heading. Are you with me? That is why it's important that when you study a question like that, that you study the headings and then with each heading you study what does that heading tells me and what should I know regarding that heading. So that is very important for you. Okay, so that is why I state here, you can see I stated, write the down the headings and then you write two or three sentences under each heading explaining what is going on. Again. Now, when you write an essay, let's look at the essay itself. It has an introduction. It has a main part. It has an additional part and it has a conclusion. Now, in the introduction, let us look at this question again. Discuss in detail the reasons for international trade. So in this case, you can write a definition of international trade. You can write a definition on demand reasons. What is demand reasons? Or your definition can be on what is supply reasons. So in meaning an, an introduction should be a, a should be a definition explaining your topic under investigation. Then we go to the main part. In this case, like I've said to you, it can be the whole question. It can be the question which states, discuss the international reasons. Then you will have demand reasons and you give your demand reasons. Then you write your supply reasons and you give the supply reasons. And then uh, now the main part will count 26 marks and then you go to the additional part. Now the additional part is a higher order question and in many cases they ask you to evaluate something, they ask you to give your opinion, they ask you to use a model or draw a diagram and explaining it. So, so grade 12s, at the end of the day, please attempt the additional part. Give your own opinion, because in many cases, you cannot tell me you are up to grade 12 at school, you know nothing. So there is something that you know about the topic, 
So that means that you need to write something on that topic. So that additional part will count 10 marks. And then the conclusion. The conclusion is basically where you summarize what you've done in the, in the, in the main part. Again, the conclusion, please do not repeat the question. Many learners tend to, they tend to repeat the question in the introduction or they tend to repeat the question in the conclusion. That will give you zero marks. When you write the conclusion, please just do a summary of what you see. For example, you can say international trade is a very important aspect of, of trade because our countries is not is dependent on one another. We cannot um, um, we cannot operate in isolation. It gives our consumers a wider choice, etc. So that will give you two marks. Can you see? You can get at least thirty to thirty-five marks for an essay, and that puts you in a better place to pass your exam. That is why I say, study your essays. Write your essays and do not leave the essays open. I think you've got the gist of it all now, because in my case, or my opinion, it is that learners who tend to, to write the essays or who attend the essays are those learners who usually are successful in the economics question paper. Now, you know, if you get you pass your, 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 done your, your, your done your paper one and you've done your paper two, it puts you in a better position at the end of the day to pass economics, which you say it is very difficult. But the thing of them, the thing is, you know the essays, start studying it and start, and when you get in the exam, you're doing it. Now, I think, I finish now. Okay, I can just skip over now to the, so, Grade 12s, now we are going to do the data response. We will focus on data response. Now, again, you know, sometimes learners say that the tutor don't give them time to complete the data response. You must remember when you look at that question paper, there's a time allocation to each question. For example, for data response, there's a 40 mark question, it's 40 mark, but you only have 30 minutes to do it. Now you can see, we cannot give you 20 minutes to do an exercise of 10 marks. You need to work with time because that is what is expected of you to do in the exam. So for a data response, you will basically have about 10 minutes to, to, to 11 minutes to do a data response in the exam. So if you have one data response is 11 minutes or 10 minutes, the second one, 10 minutes, give you 20 minutes. So that gives you only 10 minutes for those two eight marks and those two two marks. So you can see, you cannot say that you need more time. You need to work faster and you need to write faster because time is linked to marks. So now I will give over to Ms. Pretorius. She will be the tutor. Good morning, everyone. Great twelves. Um, this is Ms. Pretorius here. So as um, we'll take over from where Mr. Green stopped, we'll start with the data response. You guys have it in your um, workbook that was supplied to you. I'm going to put the graph up on the screen right now for section B. So we are starting with macroeconomics, main topic one. So, um, Typical section B question for 10 marks. There will be five questions. Um, study the instruction is for us to study the graph below and answer the questions that follow. So we have our questions up here. What, um, questions 1.1 up to 1.5. In the winter school, we went through this, like um, your mark allocation is important. It will give you an indication of how to answer the question or how much detail to provide. Just be in mind that with your section B questions, the answers you will not necessarily find your answers in the supplied information. So in the table or in the graph or in the article that is supplied with or data response will be related to the topic. Okay. 
So um, it is now 10.37. I'm going to give you guys um, a few minutes, let's say seven, eight minutes to answer these questions and then we'll work through the answers. We're going to try and get some interaction from you guys so that you guys um, can respond. I could just maybe get an indication um, of the various schools and I can actually direct the questions at specific schools so that we can get some answers from you guys. So um, I know you guys also haven't done this work in a while. So before we go through the answers, I'm going to give you some time to put on your own. You do have some of your educators there with you to assist and your textbooks or your core notes. And then just to reinforce, we'll do a look at the graph itself and unpack the graph shortly before we work through the answers. Could I perhaps get an indication or the names of the schools that are tuned in and that are joining us in this session? At the moment, we have uh, Furbra from what I can see, Manzum Tombo, Rosendal, Sinenjongo. Okay, so Furbra, Manzum Tombi, Manzum Tombo, Rosendal, and Sinenjongo, and then we have a few that are signed in under okay. people's names, which I am not sure uh, okay. which schools they are. Okay. So, um, great to ask, prepare yourselves for Brahai, Manzum Tombo, Rosendal, and Sinenjongo. Um, we have get a little of healthy competition going here or interactive um, session with you guys to see what which responses you come up with. And then we have a response uh, from uh, Mr. Johannes Adams that says Balha High is in as well. Okay, welcome to Balha High. So to all the participants, I'll give you guys um, two, three more minutes. It's now we are now at 10:41. Um, we'll start with the answer new question answer session at 10:45. It should be four minutes.
Uh, Ma'am, we have a question. It's not really a question yes. coming from um, Ethan Andrew to say that you must speak louder, but I just want to say, um, sir, you may need to increase your volume on your side because I can hear, I can hear perfectly fine here on my side. So just make sure that your computer volume level is increased to maximum, please. Okay, so um, great class. Let's start with this. Um, we're just going to look at again just the structure quickly how the 10 marks are broken down in the section B question. Your first two questions would always be your one mark, so that would be just to name or list, or as in this case, um, the first question basically comes from the graph, so you're the answer you will find in the graph. Bear in mind or just remember that your answers will not always be related to the graph or related, um, sorry, directly on the data response, but it will be related to the topic. OK, um, what I did notice is that on the graph, if we go back here in your um, learner, <laughs> it does actually say at the top of the graph, it tells you what the topic is. So it says here data response, demand and supply policies. So they already, not in the question itself, had it be, if this had been in the question paper, but out of the booklet, your, your tutoring, the uh, learner workbook, you find, find the, some answers as well. So question 1.1, what is illustrated in the graph above? Could we have an answer there from Rosendahl High, if possible? Then I'm going to allocate a question to each school. So, um, question 1.1 will leave to Rosendahl High. Question 1.2 could go to Fuerbra. Question 1.3, let's give that to Sanin Jongo. Question 1.4 can go to um, Manzum Tombo. And then question 1.5, the all the lucky winners. Question 1.5. So, um, Rosendahl High, what is illustrated in the graph above? Is there any answer coming through here? I actually mentioned the answer as well. No communication from them, then we're going to make it open. We open up the floor. Anyone welcome to answer? To supply an answer there for question 1.1. We have a response from Rosendahl yes. okay. saying that um, demand and supply. Yes, that's correct. So question 1.1, what is illustrated in the above graph? We would accept demand and supply, but typically, yes, demand and supply side policies. Um, so basically, we are dealing with the new economic paradigm smoothing out of business cycles. <coughs> Excuse me. Question 1.2. So that is the correct answer. Right off, demand and supply side policies. Question 1.2. Thank you, Rosanna, for that. Question 1.2 to Fuerbrug. At which point will inflation prevail? If I could maybe just have an indication from the schools, would they want us to rather switch to me explaining the graph from the um, from you know from the origin how um, the situation starts with original equilibrium demand and supply, and then the eventual steps that happen? Would you first want to answer the questions, and if we run into any problems, we can go to the explanation.
Okay, now we have a response here. Mm -hmm. um, Ethan Andrew, I'm not sure which school this is. Is it St. Andrew's High? I think could be it. 1.5. It is an answer yes. for 1.54 from Palha. Reducing the cost of production, improving the efficiency of inputs, improving the efficiency in markets. And that's from Belha High School. Okay, so they are saying improving efficiency of markets. So improving the market uh, mechanisms itself and improving inputs. Correct. Okay. I'm just jotting down those answers so that we can, when we do come to one, we get to 1.5, um, then I'll put all the answers up on the screen. But I would like to, for us to start off going to the next question before actually checking whether that answer is correct or not. But I have jotted that down. Thank you, Val Hai. So, question 1.2 At which point will inflation prevail? So, I'm going to go back to the graph. We're looking at the graph. Um, the points that we are well, the possibilities for an answer to that question would be either point B or A, B or C. So, um, if there's no response to that question yet, I will supply and an answer. We, yes? we do have a hand up from Manzum Tombo. Manzum Tombo, mm -hmm. please go ahead, unmute your microphone and ask your question. Please unmute, then we can go ahead. Oh, ma'am, it seems you might continue. Okay. So, if there's no answer to 1.2, I'm going to skip the answers and I'll actually start with the graph and maybe that will be um, bring a bit more clarity to the learners. So, what we're going to have on the screen and uh, what you can see in front of you, this is what we are starting off with. We have our um, aggregate demand curve. We have an aggregate supply curve. And what we know from even grade nine EMS is that when the demand, where the demand and the supply curve intersects over here at point B, that is what would um, be called or what is known as the equilibrium point, right? Then we have a corresponding price, which is at price level P. And we have our quantity or our real output at point Q or quantity Q, right? So, first of all, aggregate demand, aggregate supply. The word aggregate just means the sum of or the total. So, this means the total demand or the total amount of goods and services that is um, demanded or consumed in a country or in a market by the various participants in. Um, in the country, so that would be households, the government, businesses, etc. Right. So the total expenditure, the, the 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 amount of money that we as participants in the circular flow in the country are spending on goods and services, that would be our aggregate demand. And aggregate supply would now represent the producers or the business. So the total quantity of goods and services that is offered or that is available on the market at any given time at various price levels, right? So we start off with, with the original equilibrium at point B, with the price P and quantity Q. So now we have um, we have an increase in demand. So demand is stimulated and your aggregate demand increases, which means now this aggregate demand curve, the AD curve, shifts outwards, which now results in a new aggregate demand curve, okay? which we now label or call AD1. Now, if we go back to the basics of our price formation or demand and supply, we need a demand curve and a supply curve intersecting for an original or for an um, equilibrium point. So demand is increasing, but can businesses keep up with the increased demand because it's not overnight or in a few hours that reduction can take place. So should aggregate supply not be able to keep up with the aggregate demand, this increased demand, what, we, what will happen is now that we will have a new equilibrium or a new point um, existing. Sorry, let me just go back. 
So we have now point A that originates now. So what happens at point A? Can you see what happens to the price if we have a look here? Point A is above price P. So the goods will become more expensive. So there's increased demand for more people are demanding certain goods and services. However, businesses or the producers cannot keep up with the increased supply because the supply is not increasing simultaneously. So what will happen is, yes, supply might increase to a smaller extent or a smaller degree of, of increase, but the price will be higher. And this, in turn, will now lead to inflationary conditions, meaning that prices are increasing. However, the other extreme is that if demand increases, aggregate demand increases from AD to AD1, okay, we're following that, and supply increases simultaneously or at the same time, so supply can keep up with demand. So now your supply curve shifts from AS to AS1. This will now result in a new equilibrium price, okay, which will now be represented here by point C. And what you can see is that point C will be at the same price level of P, and the change that now takes place is in the quantity supply. So the aggregate demand, people, us as consumers, households, whoever um, represents aggregate demand, we now increase demand. There's now increased demand from quantity Q to Q1. The real output increases from Q to Q1, but supply also um, keeps up with, with the, the quantity demand. And this means that prices remain the same. Okay, so what we can see here is to answer question 1.2, the question is at which point will inflation prevail? So the answer there will be point A. For one mark, your answer will be at point A. Then the reason for this is not, the reason is not asked, but we can give a reason for you to understand this is the increase in aggregate demand from AD to A1, right? The demand curve, the aggregate demand curve shifts. But at the same time, there's no increase or supply can't keep up. So we have a situation where we have too much money um, chasing too little goods. So there's not enough goods and services to keep up with the demand. Then we will have inflationary conditions, right? However, when supply keeps up with demand, so AD1 shifts outwards from AD to AD1, and at the same time, the supply and the supply also increases from AS to AS1. We have a new uh, market equilibrium, which is at point C. Quantity increases from Q to Q1, and the price remains the same. Okay? So I'm just going to go back to the questions. If you got any questions on that, you are free to ask um, questions using um, the WhatsApp line. So let's just get back to the answers. So we have with question 1.1, we double it at which point will inflation prevail at point A. Okay. So question 1.3. Can, can we have I a response you? from Sin and yes. Jongo? Yes. The new eco economic paradigm implies that economic stability can be achieved through policy decisions related mm -hmm. to supply and demand in the economy. Yes, thank you so much for that, Senator um, Njongo. That is correct for your two marks. So you are saying that um, the new economic paradigm implies that economic stability can be achieved through um, basically long-term policy decisions, and this will be related to demand and supply in the economy. That's correct. So what we are saying is that um, we don't want policymakers or government to just make use of monetary and fiscal policies. But there are other methods that can also be used in conjunction with monetary and fiscal policies um, to achieve economic stability or to achieve economic growth and development. And this would be related to demand and supply. So that's 100 percent. Thank you so much, Sinan Jongo, um, for that answer. We will move on to question 1.4. What would happen to the output if supply did not respond to the change in demand? So I'm just going to put up the graph on, on, on the screen. So the question asks us, if AS1, this curve, the, the, the supply curve did not respond 
to the increased demand, what would happen to the real output over here? So if this AS1 curve is not here, what happens to the supply or what would happen to the output? Maybe I should put the graph on the screen again. So we have our original curves. And now we have increased demand, but we do not have a corresponding shift of the aggregate supply curve to AS1. So the question ones we want to know, what we want to know is what happens to the output. That would be Manzun Tomo. For two marks, what is your answer? Is there anyone else that would like to attempt answering this question? Any of the other schools, you are welcome to um, assist or to help us to share your answers. We assume it's St. Andrew's High that's here with us as well, any of the other participants. Anyone care to share the answer with us? Okay, guys, I'm for the interest of time and so that we can work through as many um, questions as possible. I'm just going to put up the answers on the screen now, the last ones. Um, but how we'll get to your answer now, your question as well. Right, so question one going for what would happen to the output if supply did not respond to the change in demand? So the answer simply put the output would still increase. The reason for this is some of you would think that supply is not corresponding, that there's not a corresponding increase in supply to keep up with the demand. Um, so this AS1 curve is not there. But if you have a look at point A where point A is, right, you can see that if we guess the price would increase, so inflationary conditions would set in, so there would be an increase in price. However, there would be more goods and services available to satisfy the demand, but it won't be to satisfy all the demand. Just um, if we think in terms of the pandemic as well. The situation that we had when we were in lockdown level five and four. Um, I'm going to use the example of the tobacco ban. So there was a ban on cigarettes, tobacco products, which were essentially not supposed to be available in the economy. But there was still a, a, an, an increase in demand. So um, because the product was scarce, more people wanted, they were looking you know, at different sources of, of, of buying this product. The price of the cigarettes increased or the tobacco products increased and the quantity that was supplied also increased, but not to such a great extent as from Q to Q1, where the price remained the same, where aggregate supply responded as well. So um, simply put, your answer would then just be that output would increase. It won't increase as much, but uh, the supply will try and keep up with the increase in demand. I hope. Um, that is clear to you guys or that you understand that. Let's go to the last question. The high supply does not answer. Ms. Pretoria, yes, sorry, Ms. Pretoria. Sir? Um, has a hand up there. They've got a question. I'm gonna okay. um I'm gonna unmute the mic, then they can ask. Yes, sir. Can I do that now? Oh, I can't do it. Oh, my mic. Can they ask a question? Yes, they might go ahead. Tombo, um, can they? It seems to me they can't. You're not getting anything from them, they may must agree. I will. And we can continue. Okay, so we are going to go on to question 
How will the government reduce the cost of production to stimulate the supply side of the economy? So, um, Baha Hai says, yes, improving the efficiency of markets and in, by improving input. So, if markets, so you will see that those answers might not be answered, but it's a, um, those replies would be accepted. So, um, just to give some 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 insight into that, improving markets in terms of how markets operate would make it much easier for businesses to cut for for or suppliers or producers to conduct their business. So that would mean that they would have ease of doing business. Production costs might increase, I'm uh, sorry, decrease, and they would be able to supply more goods and services to the market. So yes, um, that would be done if all market structures in terms of what the government provides is put in place, you know, reducing the amount of um, red tape, bureaucratic things that businesses have to deal with, um, that would improve the efficiency of markets. And then when we look in terms of improving inputs, so this would refer to our factors of production if, um, let's say, in terms of skills, training, upskilling, um, labour, so government um, makes some form of training or internships and etc. available. So it's a way that government reduces costs because they are subsidizing the, the training or the upskilling of the workers. That will also contribute to that as well. And you could have look at the mark allocation, guys. That is for four marks. So that means that you have to supply two facts or two expla exp um, explanatory sentences to earn yourself that four marks. So it would need to be full sentences, not just one word replies, okay? So government can reduce costs by, let's look at what we have up on the screen, supply infrastructure services such as transport, communication, water and energy. So if these services that are provided by government in terms of infrastructure that businesses need um, in the production process, so if we look at transport, for example, public or public roads are in a good condition, um, your airports and your harbors and all of those things you have available in maybe every major city or major town, etc. They have access to the transport network. It makes it so much easier for businesses to go about to conduct business and to transport for the logistic purposes to transport the goods around. Communication, internet connectivity, email, you know, you don't have to physically be at work or in the place of business to do business, right? Online um, orders and things like that. Water and power supply or energy supply, if you look in terms of South Africa. ESCO, if we had um, a reliable energy source, you know, less load shedding, etc. Because every time we <laughs> Every time we experience load shedding, businesses are losing money. So the cost of production increases because they now need to invest in generators, etc. Okay? Um, implementing cash incentives, for example, subsidies. So making the, reducing the cost on the side of the producer. Compensating businesses who locate to neglected areas with high employment. So some areas might not be an attractive investment opportunity to businesses. Um, for various reasons, it could be because of safety concerns, high crime, etc. Or it's too far, um, the location, it's too far from main transport networks, etc. Um, communication infrastructure isn't too good in that area. And as a result of this, there's high unemployment in the area. But uh, businesses could be convinced, so incentivize, government incentivizes for them to open up in those areas because if a mall should be built in a certain area or certain um, industrial businesses, factories, etc., opens up in an area, it provides immediate employment to the local community in that area, which in turn has a domino effect in terms of um, people are working, they earn an income, they, they want to spend more money in the economy. So there's a knock-on effect in terms of the circular flow, right? Then compensating exporters for certain costs that they incur in the development of export markets. So the word compensating, basically, you're just saying it's a financial um, payment of some sort to businesses to lower the production costs. Okay. Um, are we all okay with that? Could we move on? 
from this um, question. We want to question number two. If there's no questions or any comments or additional answers, if anyone else has anything to add to question 1.5. Nothing coming through, so we will move on, guys. Okay, so that question was related to um, demand and supply policies. We are still with macroeconomics. So question two, um, we are going to look at, we are studying the table and then answering the questions that follow. Again, it's the same structure in terms of um, section B dot responses for 10 marks. You have five questions, the first two questions, one mark each, you have two, two more questions, and then you have your four more question. What we have up in front of us is a um, table with some information from the South African or from our government, from our national accounts. So um, this we will also find in with regards to the topic on the circular flow. So we are looking at um, GDP figures, production, income, and expenditure. Okay. Let's have a look at the information supply. So the information supply was at on um, the base year, basically, of 2010. And the information supply for three years pertaining to 2018, 2019, and 2020. So we look at each one of these lines. So just to maybe refresh your memory. Um, we have final cons consumption expenditure by households. So it's basically this refers to what we as households or private individuals or consumers spend in the economy, right? The money that we spend on goods and services. Then final consumption expenditure by general government, money government spends on purchases in um, the country. So they also buy goods and services. And then gross capital formation. So just a little question I'm going to throw out there. What is another word that could be used for gross capital formation? And or connected to that, who does this, which one of the participants is represented by gross capital formation? Spending by whom? So this is expenditure by which participant? We have households, we have the government, we have two more participants if it's an open economy. Which one um, is represented by gross capital formation? Is there anyone that can um, help us with that? Okay, so we're going to move along. So gross capital formation is basically represents your investments, right? And um, typically, if, okay, if we think in terms of the participants in an economy of the circular flow, we have our households, we have the government, another participant would be firms or businesses, and then if it is an open economy, okay, we would have the um, foreign sector involved as well. So, gross capital formation represents the firms, right, or businesses. So, the investment um, in the economy, any money um, or expenditure by business or firms. So, I'm looking at the responses over here. So, in Chongo Hai, they're answering the questions already. Question 2.1. Uh, the first question, which is, which institution published the information in the graph above? Yes, we have the SARB, the South African Reserve Bank. Thank you, Sinanjongo High School. And then um, question 2.2, these guys are really working. Okay, so the schools, you need to, pick, you need to keep up with us. Um, question 2.2. Which method is used in the calculation of gross domestic product above? So, the clue already, if we're looking at final consumption expenditure, final consumption expenditure by government or by the household, so it's the expenditure method. 
Thank you, Sinjongo High School. Um, just for interest sake, we have three methods to calculate GDP, which is the income method, the production method, and the expenditure method. The one we are dealing with now is the expenditure method. Okay. Then let's move on to the other questions. Question 2.3, what is the purpose of the residual item when the expenditure method is used to calculate national income? We have Ethan, Andrew, okay, we're not sure which school, thank you <laughs> for clarifying from the why. That is 100% correct, it's basically to balance the account, so it's like a balancing figure. Or we could say it just makes provision, makes provision for any omissions and errors that might have occurred in calculating these figures. Thank you so much, the Belhar High, for question 2.3. I hope you guys got that. So, to fix errors, yes, thank you, Sinanjongo High School. 100% correct, two marks to you there. Okay. Um, let's move on to question 2.4. Explain the difference between current prices and constant prices. Thus, we're going to leave open to anyone. So, what's the difference with the current prices and constant prices? So, I have the questions up on the screen for you guys. Mm -hmm. Something that is constant. Something that is constant. Madam Tomohai, do you have a question or an answer for us? Okay, we have another response here from Balhor High. They are saying for question 2.4, the impact of inflation has not been taken into account. Okay, whereas a consistent price is taken into account. Okay, um, Ethan or Bel, Ethan Andrew or Balhor High, could you just um, specify for me that what what it, where the impact of inflation for which one is it taken into account? Is it taken into account for current prices or taken into account for constant prices? Okay, so Sidon Jongo High is saying current prices includes the real GDP, then constant includes normal GDP. Current prices includes real GDP and constant normal GDP. So for me, for us to accept that answer, you're going to have to have given a bit more detail with regards to what real GDP is, what it takes into account, and what not normal. I think you are, you are referring to nominal GDP. Eh? So just to get back to the horse response there, um, the response was that the impact of inflation was not taken into account. Okay, so that is applicable to nominal GDP or to your current prices. So the difference between the two is basically if inflation is taken into account, the effects or the impact of inflation, we are referring to current prices, and if the effects um, or price changes were, were not taken, in, taken into account, so inflation was not taken into account, that would be being referred to constant prices. So I think that was just a typing error there from Sidon Jongo High School, um, where you say includes normal, it should be nominal, and then um, how high the impact of inflation was not taken into account. So you were referring to current prices, and that is correct over there. But but remember, oh sorry, our mark, I guess our mark allocation was for two marks. So. Um, the impact of inflation not taken into account. So I would suggest that you would have added to that answer um, with current prices. For current prices, the impact of inflation or inflation is not taken into account for you to earn that two marks over there. Thank you so much, guys. 
The last question, question 2.5. So a bit of a calculation there for four marks. Calculate the final consumption expenditure by households for 2020 as a percentage of the GDP at market prices. And you are required to show all, sorry, to show all calculations. So basically what you need to calculate for us is, <laughs> over here you had to calculate, um, use B, what is labeled B, this figure over here, okay? 4,972,976 rands. So that amount, we want to know if we look at final consumption expenditure of households, this 2,978,346, as a percentage, what percentage does this represent of the total amount of B? And remember, if we were to calculate a percentage, we need to multiply by 100, divide by 1 to make a figure a percentage. Anyone have a response for us there? What that percentage is and how we got to that percentage? Final consumption expenditure of our households show that as a percentage of the GDP at market prices. Okay, right, guys, uh, I can see that someone is typing a response here, um, but I'm going to put up the answers on the screen. Okay, let's see what we have here. 59.89%, that is correct, but remember, we want to see the whole calculation. Thank you, Belhoi. We need to see the whole calculation. I'm assuming that the first answer came from St. Jongo High School. Yes, the answer is correct, but we need to see the whole calculation for you to earn your four marks. Because the question tells you, show all calculations. Okay, so what we do is, if you have a look on the, up on the screen, um, we take the final consumption expenditure of our households, the 2,978,356, 2, divided by the total um, expenditure, right? Multiplied by 100 divided by 1, which will give us a percentage. So it could either be 59.89% or you could round it off to 59.9%. So you will get two marks for showing your calculation. Sorry, one mark for the figure for final consumption expenditure divided by the um, Total figure, which is formally 972,976, multiplied by 100, divided by 1, and your final answer would either be 59.89% or 59.9%. Thank you so much for that, guys. Let's see. So, the whole eye, you got that calculation correct there. So, you just typed it wrong. I see you guys just typed the final answer wrong. You put down here 5.98%, which should, should actually be 59.8%. Thank you so much for that correction there. So um, we'll move on. Let's see if we can get another, complete another question. We still have about 
20, 20 minutes, so we can actually do the next question, guys. Question three. Let's see what that's about. Okay, so question three, we are still with macroeconomics. Um, we are looking at the Phillips curve over here. Study the graph below and answer the questions that follow. So on the one axis, we have our inflation rate here as a percentage. So 2%, 4%, 6 8 10%. And on the other axis, we have the unemployment um, rate, okay, ranging from zero unemployment with um, 16%. And um, our Phillips curve, okay. What does the Phillips curve represent? I don't want to get rid of myself. It might be one of the questions over here to do an explanation. Yes, it is a question. So I'll give you guys again. Um, we'll answer these questions as we go along. Let's have a look at the questions. So 3.1, what does the above curve represent? That we take from the graph. The answer is on there. Name the point that represents the national rate of unemployment. Okay. Um, so let's see how far we get with this. You guys are welcome to send through your responses. So we have the others with question three now. So 3.1, what does the above curve represent? Anyone have a response for us over there? Okay, yes, we do have a response here. It seems we only have two schools that are actively participating with us. Sinanjongo High School, you were first with an answer. You say the relationship between inflation and unemployment. Um, okay, so... Both of you guys are saying the relationship between inflation and unemployment. Yes, that is what it shows on the graph. That is the relationship between those two um, variables, inflation and unemployment. However, the answer we are looking for over here is basically the name of the curve. What 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 do, what do we call it? Okay, so the above curve is a Phillips curve, so that would have been your answer. Um, I'm the question is a bit ambiguous right? because it says what does the above curve represent? It represents the relationship between inflation and unemployment. So yeah, let's move on to question 3.2. Name the point that represents the natural rate of unemployment. So so how I says sorry. We'll just get back to the graph. The whole high says 12% A, and so the jungle high says 12 as well. I'm assuming you say 12% for unemployment. So yes, I can see why why you guys are saying 12%. Uh, but with the answer we are looking for the yes, point A, okay. Um, name the point that represents the natural rate of unemployment. Yes, that is at point A or at 12%. But the point specifically was also, we would say point A. Okay. So then, Jongo, what are you saying here? A and C. Point A. Okay. Um, just a reminder, guys, um, not to forget to complete the attendance register. Okay, all of you guys, you need to complete the attendance register. Let's move on to question 3.3. Explain the relationship between inflation and unemployment. So, what is happening on this graph? What is the Phillips curve? What does it show us that? So, if unemployment is high, what happens to inflation? If unemployment decreases, what happens to inflation? So basically explain, because I see a lot of, if I look at my own learners, they're my learners, um, and in general, let's see what Buren High School, we have an answer here from Buren High School. Inflation is a sustained and significant increase in the general price level over a period of time. Okay, and unemployment is when someone is looking for a job, is capable of, of doing that job, but cannot find a job. 
Um, so you're in high school. Yes, you are to tell me you are giving us the definitions of the two concepts. That is not what the question requires. So this is a common um, misconception or a common mistake made by learners when they answer a question like this. So the question wants to know to explain the relationship between the two. It's not for you to explain what the two concepts are. So you are giving you a definition of unemployment, of, sorry, of unemployment and inflation. We want to know what the relationship between the two is. Um, yes, so St. John for High School, what do we have here? So when unemployment decreases, inflation will increase. That's 100% correct. That's the two marks. So the relationship between the two is there's an inverse relationship to a negative relationship or another word for inverse means opposite. If the one element or the one variable increases, the other one will decrease. So if inflation increases, unemployment will decrease. If inflation decreases, unemployment will increase, okay? And vice versa. So that's 100% correct. Thank you, Sinan Jongo. Hi. When unemployment decreases, inflation rate increases. Even if you had just said that there's an inverse or negative or opposite relationship, that will also earn you your two marks. Thank you for that. Then question 3.4. What measures could be used by government to reduce unemployment? I see that, Sinan Jongo. Um, I'm sorry. It was the whole high. I had answered that. No. You label the 3.3, but it's actually 3.4. Yes. <laughs> okay, the whole I answered as well. And then we also had. Good morning, Mr. Nakaz. I think you are from Fayetteville High School. Um, so when he's answering question 4.3, when inflation increases, employment will decrease. Yes, there's an opposite relationship. So we're moving on to question 3.4. The whole I says. If there is improved education um, as a measure, effective training or fewer restrictions on migration of skilled labor, let's have a look. I'll put the answers up on the screen for you. Okay, so we, we've dealt with those questions. 3.4, what measures could be used by the government to reduce unemployment? 100% there, well, how high? Um, let's see if there was anyone else that answered this question. No. Okay, so so far, well, oh, I don't know why I'm putting the answers up on the screen. I guys can see 3.5. Eh? Um, so improved education, yes, that's 100%. And effective training, if there were fewer legal restrictions on businesses, so in terms of um, bureaucratic things and, and red tape, you know, documentation, etc., a lot of restrictions. Um, we businesses don't have a lot of room to maneuver. Fewer restrictions on the immigration of skilled workers, yes. So any one of those measures could be put in place to reduce unemployment. Thank you so much for that. Let's move on to 3.5. You guys are really getting into the swing of this, going much better. Um, we we're actually working through the questions quite faster, right? So 3.5 or four marks. Why will inflation not accelerate when full employment exists? So for us to answer this question, we need to actually understand this graph. We need to understand that inverse relationship that if inflation is high, unemployment decreases. Okay, so if inflation is low, we have high unemployment. Um, so why will inflation not accelerate when full employment exists? Let's see who gives us a response or who is an answer there for us. So for four marks, that means you would have to give me two facts or two sentences. Anybody? No. I feel like I should have been having an auction on here <laughs> for answers. Um, we haven't really had so well how high as in Jongo and we have Fedel now that it's come um, that participating for the Mazen Tombo, are you still there? It wasn't how high. 
We would love to hear from you guys. All right, let's continue. I'll put the answers up on the screen for you. For question five, so possible, possible um, responses or, yeah. So workers, so before we can get to the answer, so why will inflation not accelerate or why won't it increase when full employment? So when we full employment, what we are saying is that there is no unemployment. Everyone is working in the economy. Why will prices not increase? Okay. So what we are looking at over here is that workers expect prices to be the same as. Okay. What do you get? I have an answer um, coming up here from the whole high. They are saying this inflation is a result of workers having more disposable disposable income, which would drive prices upward. Okay. This happens generally before we hit full employment, right? As more people start working, we have disposable income and this has an effect on the inflation rate or the general price levels, which will increase, yes, it drives prices upward. But now we are taking it a step further. We are saying there is full employment, so everyone is working, prices have increased. Um, let me go back to the graph, here we have Full employment to a higher rate, sorry, zero rate of unemployment, okay, low unemployment, full employment, and inflation rate is high. So, why would the inflation not increase if we have everyone working? Because things sort of sort, sort of settle down in the economy, um, the supply is keeping up with demand, right? So we don't have inflationary measures setting in or that situation existing where we have too much money chasing too little goods. Supply is keeping up with demand. So aggregate supply is keeping up with aggregate demand. And which means over a long or period of time, for example, a year, prices remain constant or remain the same. So we would go back to the answer there. Workers expect prices to be the same as last year. Yes. And because of this, everyone is working in the economy and everyone is earning enough, they have enough disposable income and goods, the prices are remaining the same. It means there's no pressure um, for workers to request or want an increase in wages because everything is sort of remaining stable in the economy. So there's no price pressure. Remember, if prices increases, it means we have our purchasing power, our buying power decreases, we can buy less goods with our money. But if prices remain constant, fairly constant, and there's no further increase in the general price levels, so there's no inflation setting in, i.e. inflation, labor would now not demand as high a wage increase because there's no pressure over there. Okay? Also, again, guys, I'm um, just a reminder to not forget, colleagues, do not forget to complete the attendance register. We put it up there in, in, in the chat, okay? So two schools so far, only two schools have submitted. Um, the link was posted there for you guys just to complete the attendance registers, please. So we are, any questions on this, guys, before we move on? You could actually go to question four as well and see how much time we have left. Yeah, we have about 10 minutes left, so we could start with the next one, with question four. Nothing coming through, so let's move on. Question four. And question four. I actually almost worked all of it. Nice. Almost all of it. So question four again, we are given a graph. And we have to study the graph and answer the questions that follow. Um, on this graph, we can see that we have tax revenue or tax income on the one axis in billions. So, Sorry, ma'am. Ma yes. Um, we we don't have the attendance register, ma'am. Can we send it on the on the chat because hey, we don't have the, the chat thingy on oh, on every question boy at the bottom. Okay, 
Andrews. St. Andrews High School, man. Okay. Um, are you guys on? We're not on the WhatsApp chat. This is in the, the on the Teams, right? On the link that you can join the meeting. The attendance register was posted a few minutes ago. Okay, man. Like. Okay, thank so you, man. Can you just click on that? On that link there for the attendance register. It was posted at about 27, at 11.27. Okay. Do you see that there? Are you able to access it? Yes, ma'am. I'm going to go look now. Where is it? Just scroll up a bit. Oh, yeah, I'm going to go. Oh, yeah, I'm going to go. Just scroll up in the chat. Yes? There's no button for the chat like by the other words or classes. That's what I'm trying to say. Oh, okay. Okay, if the chat is inaccessible, um, what you can do is just send a, a, a message from the school and then I can I can reply on your chat with the link for the, for link. the registration. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So. Thank you. Like the accident, Jongo High School over here responding already to the questions. Um, so as I was saying, that we have tax revenue on the one axis and the tax rate on the other axis, right? And um, question 4.1, identify the curve in the graph above. So the Jongo High has responded to us. They are said yes it's called the left of curve thank you very much for that so for one mark you would have earned that mark there what the curve is called it's the left of curve then question 4.2 at what the tax rate will government revenue be maximized so if we're looking at the tax rate at zero if there's no tax coming in right no one is paying tax the tax rate is zero government doesn't earn any revenue and if we move up, yes, the wasn't no high. Thank you so much. So the was no high says at 45%. Um, St. Jongo High School says 45%. That is 100% correct, guys. So tax, sorry, government revenue is maximized here at this point, 45%. They have maximum revenue of 200,000, 200 billion um, rands tax revenue. That is the maximum revenue achieved by government. Thank you so much for that. Then. Question 4.3, how much revenue will the government receive if the tax rate is 100%? So Jongo High School has responded. They said 0%. That is correct. Thank you so much. If you guys have a look at the screen, you'll see that if the tax rate is at 100%, that means no revenue coming into the government. Just put, put yourself in the situation or imagine yourself in the situation if you are earning a salary of let's say 10,000 rand per month and the tax rate is 100%. That means that your whole salary you will pay for tax. So there's no incentive, you will not be motivated to go out there and work to make your labor available because you will have no income. So basically everything will go towards tax, right? So if the tax rate is 100%, government revenue is zero. Then question 4.4. What effect will a decrease in the tax rate? So if the tax rate was 65%, if it decreased to 45%, what would be the effect of the revenue for the government? Listen and Jongo are answering question 4.5 already. Let's first deal with question 4.4. So question 4.4, if the tax rate was 65%, let's have a look at the revenue. Revenue would be 175 billion rand, right, for government government would have um, income or revenue of 175 billion. Now, if the tax rate was decreased to 45%, what happens to the tax revenue? <laughs> yeah. 
We look at the graph at 65%. Tax revenue is 175 billion rand. At 45%, what's happening here? It goes from 175 billion to 200 billion. So, if we pay less tax, Just a reminder here, great loss, please. For tomorrow, because we are busy with question four now, so for tomorrow, when we start off the session, you complete at home or you do this on your own. Question five and question six, and then we will just briefly at the beginning of the session, we'll move up, work through those answers. And then we will focus on paper two tomorrow, move on to paper two, and we'll also look at um, quick more questions. Tomorrow. Some eight more questions, question seven and eight. So does anyone have and let's see, Senator John O'Hai said that for question four point no, we are still with four point four. No response there. Yes, sorry, four point four. They did say that there will be an increase in consumer spending, meaning we will have more disposable income. But the question specifically wants us to answer what the effect will be on tax revenue and not on consumers. Teams don't snap the good songs. So can you open the link to your WhatsApp? I'm going to WhatsApp for my steel yesterday. Let me go with that. Do that. Some other thing. Okay. Yeah, so the learner that, that was um, wanting the link thing from St. Andrews High, what you can do is just to send a message in the WhatsApp chat and then we will send you the attendance register, the link for the attendance register for you guys to complete. The guys, our time has actually run out. Question 4.4, I'm just going to put it up on the screen for you guys. What effect will a decrease in the tax rate from 65% to 45% have in tax revenue? So if there's a decrease in the tax rate, this will lead to an increase in tax revenue for the government. Um, so tax revenue will go from 175 billion to 200,000 rand. This means that because we are paying less tax, more people will be encouraged to work, okay? For two marks. And then question 4.5. What would be the consequences or what consequences could a 1% VAT increase have on the different role players in the South African economy? So you could respond there with what the effect would be for households, what the effect would be for the government, what the effect would be for businesses. Okay. Um, so how could it affect the various role play players? First of all, for the government, it would be an increase in revenue because the, the um, tax rate has increased, so more revenue comes in. Households have to pay more tax and businesses have to pay more tax. It could also result in a fall of um, a decrease in production. Sure. So that brings us to the end of our session, guys. Please complete the feedback form.